Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Frontier Nursing University's celebration of National Nurse Practitioner Week. This is Dr. Lisa Chapel, and I'm the Associate Dean of Family Nursing at Frontier. I'd like to uh, introduce our featured speaker, who is Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams. As Deputy Surgeon General, Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams advises and supports the Surgeon General regarding operations of the United States Public Health Service, Commission Corps, and in communicating the best available scientific information to advance the health of the nation. She served as the Acting Surgeon General from April 2017 through September 2017 and as Chief Nursing Officer of the United States Public Health Service from 2013 through 2016. Rear Admiral Trent Adams has helped various positions in health and human services, working to improve access to care for the poor and underserved communities, both as a clinician and administrator. Prior to joining the United States Public Health Services, Rear Admiral Trent Adams was a nurse officer in the United States Army. Rear Admiral Trent Adams received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Hampton University, a Master of Science in Nursing and Health Policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and a Doctorate of Philosophy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She became a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing in 2014, and she was recently elected as a member of the National Academy of Medicine's Class of 2018. Your Admiral Trent Adams has received numerous awards for her leadership and contribution and was recently awarded the International Red Cross Florence Nightingale Medal, the highest international honor bestowed upon a nurse. So welcome to you, Dr. Um, to, to you, Dr. Trent Adams. Well, thank you so very much. Good afternoon, um, Dr. Chapel. Thank you so very much for that warm introduction. And I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here with um, Frontier University, Frontier Nursing University. And I want to say happy Nurse Practitioner Week to all the nurse practitioners on the phone. And I hope that you will have a wonderful celebration throughout this observance. Um, and I'm looking forward to um, hearing from you as we, as we go through this presentation today. Um, as you are um, preparing for this, this amazing opportunity to recognize nurse practitioners, hope that you'll never forget how much we all appreciate the work that nurse practitioners do each and every day to provide high quality health care to those in your care. I want to speak today about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, okay, I'm not able to move the slide. Do I have control over the slide? Okay. Yeah, you should see arrows there at the bottom. There we I go. got it. Okay, thank you. I'm a little technically challenged sometimes, so just bear with me. <laughs> um, I wanted to, the topic that we're talking about today is leading from where you are, the role of the nurse innovator. And this is important because at this point in time in, in, in health and in health care, nurse practitioners have a significant role to play in improving the quality of care, access to care, and also pr producing a much higher quality product for a lower cost than many other sectors of health care. Before I begin my formal remarks, I want to add my disclosure statement here. I have no financial disclosures that would be a potential conflict of interest with this presentation. I have um, three learning objectives for this presentation. I want to explore principles of leadership and how they relate to the nursing profession, specifically as they relate to nurse practitioners. I want to identify opportunities for nurses to lead in all aspects of the profession and describe ways nurses and advanced practice nurses can leverage opportunities for innovation in their practice as well as in um, new sectors where nurses are serving. Now, before we begin, I want to talk about a little bit, of, a little bit more in more detail about leadership. And leadership is a term we often use very loosely, but it has a very, very specific meaning. Leadership is simply the ability to inspire or influence others towards a goal. And what I mean by inspire, it means that an individual is able to guide someone to do something, to make someone feel that they want to do something, 
or to help someone realize that they can do whatever it may be. And this is true in not only in nursing and other sectors of healthcare, but in every aspect of one's life. Now, one area of, of, of a lot of interest right now is transformational leadership. And transformational leadership has taken on a, a, a whole new meaning in healthcare because in many ways we have had many models of leadership. We've had you know, the democratic model, you had the autocratic model, but I think what's emerging now is that we're in a very different environment whereby many aspects of healthcare require a different level of skill, especially, especially from leaders, um, but also from managers and from those who are at the executive ranks of an organization. Transformational leaders have you know, four specific types of, of skill sets, and they have the ability to influence. Having influence means that you're able to, um, in, to have an impact on decision making, that you're able to influence others to see things from a different perspective. You're bringing a, a huge value as a nurse practitioner to the healthcare environment simply by using your knowledge to then share or shift ideas and, and, and thoughts in a different way. Inspiration. Transformational leaders are able to inspire their, their team to achieve things that they probably think they could, never could achieve without someone there to reinforce um, the, the goals and objectives of the mission, and also to find value in every single person who's involved in the operation. Motivation. Motivating people to always be at their best and to allow individuals to bring their own skill sets and their best value to the, to the organization. And individual consideration. And this one I used to struggle with because, you know, coming out of a military environment, we look at all things as a team. We know that individuals make up that team. But more and more we're learning in our society, and especially in the workplace, we have multi-generational, uh, we have a multi-generational workforce. We have a very um, dynamic environment where things are changing on a daily basis. It is so important, yes, to understand your team, but you also, as a, as a transformational leader, need to be able to understand that every individual has something they bring to the table. And we all as leaders need to be able to recognize what those skill sets are and play to the strengths of those on our, on our team and also identify their weaknesses and help to improve their weaknesses to make those, um, most, make those individuals successful as well. Leadership in the healthcare setting is something that can be often challenging as we look at staffing models within the independent practice setting, um, in, the, in, in the very complex settings of healthcare, um, in the inpatient setting but also in the community. And it is critical to understand as, as healthcare providers that good leadership is important for the success of any, op or any organization or operation. Every single team member has a role in the success of the organization. And leaders have to establish the organization's mission, vision, and the goals. And I think about this in the context of much of the work that we've done in nursing in our training. The nursing process is a, is a good example of a, of, a, of a process that's used to strategically plan every single aspect of care, but also can be used as a model for developing organizational, an organizational strategic plan. Leader, leaders create an environment where individuals can work together as a team, but they also create um, an environment where everyone feels valued. Leaders value their team, and they recognize that everyone on the team is a critical part of one success. Leaders manage conflict. They don't run away from the problems. And this is ver very true in healthcare, in that when you walk into the um, clinical setting, into the clinical setting, and there may be you the nurse practitioner may be an N of one, you know that the staffing ratio may not be what you need. You may not have anyone to do intake and triage, but you figure it out. You don't turn around and walk out of the door. And that's what good leaders do. They learn how to manage conflict, and they don't run away from the problems. And I want to take this, this conversation around conflict a little bit further because there are so many instances where we identify conflict as being a negative thing. Sometimes good feedback can be, as we say, um, a, necessary, a necessary evil of, of progress. None of us see the same scenario or same situation the same way. And we as leaders have to develop those skill sets to have crucial conversations in a way that is positive, productive, 
and allow every individual to feel that they can leave the conversation unharmed. Now, I want to talk six, there are six key components of effective leadership. And these, this, I found this list um, through doing some research um, several years ago. Uh, it's it has been mentioned in, in Forbes. Uh, it's also referenced in a lot of the, um, a lot of the leadership literature by uh, Covey. But this is an amalgamation of the six key components of, of an effective leader. First and foremost, honesty and integrity. As nurse practitioners, the work that you do hinges on your ability to be honest um, as, as, a, as a broker in, in, healthcare, in the healthcare environment and have integrity in how you deal with your patients, but also with your partners and those in your community. Self-awareness. Self-awareness is something that is often understated. You know, sometimes looking in the mirror and taking a long, hard look at your strengths and your weaknesses is what we all need to do. But it's difficult sometimes to have that reflection if you don't know what your vision is for you and the organizations where you're working. Vision is so critical because you have to know that what you're doing every single day is leading to an end game. Is your, is your ultimate goal to provide health care to the underserved in a given community to achieve higher um, access to, in, in, to improve the quality? Well, if that's your vision, write it down because the vision is so critical for all leaders at every level of the organization. Uh, courage. There are times when things are not going to go your way and there are things that are going to come upon you, as you know, just being a provider. You have to have the courage to get through those difficult times. And I cannot emphasize the, the, the importance of communication, good communication skills, both written and oral skills. And, and many times in my career, I've been asked, you know, kind of impromptu, can you put together a one-pager on X? And there are times I don't know the topic area. But I'm so grateful for um, nursing school as well as uh, professional environments where I've been forced to write in different types of ways. There's the academic writing, there's policy writing, and then there's the technical writing. And I think we as leaders need to be able to master all of those areas to be able to be effective and conveying our thoughts and to be able to communicate in, on paper what it is that we want done in the organization or what we expect from others as a part of a negotiated situation or contract. And then also the oral communication skills. Wow. Uh, I think we use these as nurses very well in communicating with our patients, communicating with other providers. And, and yes, and, and also working in different spaces in the community and also advocating for the rights of our patients and taking a policy stance through um, many different settings across uh, the policy frame. And last but not least, team building. You know, we're only as good as our weakest link. And team building is absolutely critical to be able to be successful. We can be honest, we can be self-aware, we can have great vision, we can be courageous, we can have great communication skills, but if you do not have a team, a solid, wonderful, effective team working alongside you, you may not be able to achieve your mission. You may not be able to achieve your goals because you haven't congealed that team in an effective way to be able to successfully execute your mission. So innovation for a better future. So how does innovation affect nursing and healthcare? Well, as Albert Einstein says, once said, if you always do what you've always did, you'll always get what you've always got. And innovation is critical not to always get what you've always got. And I think that this is an area where nurses can really shift the game in health and in health care. And I make a distinction between those two because, as you know, um, in this country we don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system. People go to their provider primarily when they're sick. We want to inspire individuals um, in our country to go to providers for advice around prevention, mitigating risk of getting sick. Um, how do, can they protect their community? How can they protect their families? And that requires us to have an innovative mindset to look at how, how can we change the dynamics and create new pathways for nursing and for the patients that we serve. You know, by, through innovation, we can improve patient care. We can definitely develop new ideas. It allows us to establish best practices, and it gives us a, 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 a way in which we can 
open up new areas of, of research, such as, such as identifying new science and developing new strategies to improve access to care, but improving um, prevention strategies that are more successful in a community setting on a large scale. Uh, transforming observations into outcomes. And, you know, we talk about the things that we see every single day in our patient population, but also in the community from a prevention standpoint that could change the game for us in healthcare. And nurse practitioners are, are uniquely positioned to be able to make some of those observations and to develop some of those innovative and creative strategies on how we can improve prevention, how we can improve health, health care, and also change the delivery model into a model that is more amenable to um, the everyday person, those who are underserved, and those who are living in communities that are disenfranchised or marginalized related to chronic disease or other health um, disparities. Um, and the next topic of innovation is the way forward. Now, in practice, what I mean by practice-based solutions, this is about developing innovative practice models that meet the needs of a community so that we're able to have a better outcome than we've seen historically with a population or with a particular disease. And I'll talk about diabetes for a moment. One of my colleagues is a nurse practitioner at Indian Health Services, observed that many of her patients would come in episodically uh, for, for, epi for emergency type of situations related to their diabetes management or lack of management. And she worked with a number of the providers in the clinic to um, start to track the patients and when they were coming in and what were some of the life um, events that were happening that were, lead that were leading up to uh, different types of crises moments for them. And what she learned was that there were a few factors that were associated with the, these diabetic um, crises. And she uh, observed that some of them were um, unemployed, they were stressed out, some of them were single parents, there were um, conditions whereby individuals were not able to access their medications in a timely manner. Uh, transportation was an issue. Many, people, many of our patients were missing appointments because they just didn't have trial, child care, or they couldn't figure out how to get life in order for them to be able to be successful in managing their diabetes. Well, this led to several conversations across the clinic, and she learned that building a team-based model for diabetes allowed, would allow potentially a decrease in these episodic emergency situations that were happening in some of the, some of the patients that were, were um, being served in that community. It led her to having um, a focus group with the communities of, community of providers, and it involved the dietitian, the social worker, the nursing staff on the inpatient side, some of the um, engineers who worked in the community who were identifying when there were housing challenges or other issues related to transportation within the environment in general, and also some of the, some of the physicians who were um, doing long-term follow-up on, on a lot of these patients. And she decided that we needed to have a different model to meet the needs of those individuals who were being served in this community. And she developed a home visiting model for many of those who were at risk, living in very remote locations, and set up a text message system for them to be able to text in when they felt that they were in need of a, a follow-up visit or a follow-up phone call not necessarily through high-tech te telemedicine um, access, but just giving them the support and encouragement to ask questions and to get advice and guidance on how to solve problems. And they learned over several months that this was decreasing the emergency uh, visits or crises moments for these diabetic patients. And what I wanted to say about that is this is a real-time real practice-based solution that significantly improved the care as well as the follow-up for these patients. Excuse me who were at risk um, related to their diabetes. This is also a strategy in which we can use at the nurse practitioner level to reimagine healthcare delivery, to look at models that best fit the needs of a population given the resources that exist in these very um, challenging environments. I think nurse practitioners have a great tool in that they can redefine nursing based on location, sector of practice, and the bandwidth for change. And let me, let me talk about location. You know, many of our patients um, come into the healthcare setting to see their provider. And I think there are nurse managed clinics that are looking at this very differently across the country, whereby the location of the patient may not necessarily be the best solution for them to be able to get access to care. And more home based care is, a, is emerging in a lot of underserved 
populations. It's definitely emerging with the elderly and those who cannot um, have, who do not have access to transportation. Sector of practice, and I'm seeing many expansions of areas of practice for for nurses and nurse practitioners as well, and, and PAs as well, in areas where we've not seen a lot of um, of the advanced practice nurses um, serving. And I think this creates an opportunity, a window of opportunity for us to engage into many areas of consultation to inform and educate industry as well as um, insurance companies and, and pharma about the, the, the skill sets that nurse practitioners and, and um, advanced practice nurses have. And I think clinical excellence is something we have been working towards in many of our advanced practice training programs, but clinical excellence is something nursing is known for. And I, I, I know that in the way forward, as we start to tell our story about the great things that nurses and nurse practitioners are doing, we will definitely be able to create a new paradigm for nurses to enter into areas where, whereby they've not necessarily been seen as the leaders. And let me give you one example in that regard. As we build new facilities for health and health care, nurses and nurse practitioners are definitely a part, should be a, definitely be a part of that build out. This, the planning, being involved with the architecture development, looking at how um, the flow of patients are going to be organized throughout the entire facility. Because who knows patients better than nurses? No one. Nurses provide the, the vast majority of care being delivered in every healthcare setting across the country and across the world. And we spend more time with patients than any other healthcare professional in the entire healthcare system. So I think us being able to tell our story as nurse engineers, as nurse designers, as nurse advocates, um, give, us a band, give us a new bandwidth for opportunities to engage into areas of, of practice where we've not been um, necessarily before. Deliver the goods. Now, what I mean by this is uh, when, we, when we go into these new areas, we need to be able to demonstrate that nursing skills are translatable, they're transferable, and they are the highest, we can receive the highest return on investment when nurses are involved in the decision making. But don't bring us in on the back end just to be able to sanction or rubber stamp the decisions or negotiations. We need to be a part of the entire process. And what I mean by that is nurses should be generating the ideas, proposing the plans, negotiating the agreements, and then implementing or executing on the ideas as an actual intervention, and then being the author of those stories as they're, being, as they're being developed. And this is an opportunity for us to create space for nurse entrepreneurship. I know that there are many nurse-managed clinics across the country. They're, they're expanding their, their horizons in many different areas. There's a nurse who is an expert in um, environmental health here in Maryland who has done great work in, in the industries across um, the Maryland, um, the state of Maryland and the, and the entire um, District of Columbia and Virginia area looking at occupational health and safety for workers, not only in uh, warehouses, but in office buildings, looking at how nurses can advise on ergonomically designed, ergonomics of designing a new build-out space for an office, but also looking at the air quality within some of the warehouses and other buildings that are being created for um, uh, new builds and, and new opportunities for industry. And we need to heighten the awareness of what nurses can do what we are doing and how we do it. Now, this is not something that we, we would normally think of a nurse's, a nurse's role. We, we often rely on the comms uh, communications experts to do this. And if we wait for someone to write a pu uh, public service announcement about how great nurses are, you can forget it. It may not happen. We need to use every tool in the toolbox to heighten the awareness of what we're doing. And may, that may not be through some formal publication or some scholarly journal. We need to use social media and other tools that are, in our, that are in our, at our disposal to be able to talk about the great things that nurses are doing and, and also articulate how important it is to have a nursing perspective. We are holistic in our, in our approach to health and health care. I think those are great lessons for others to learn as they look at building a paradigm for improved health and health care. And this is my tagline for, for change. Times are changing. Are you ready? Um, how are you going to create your own reality? We as a profession need to look at role redefinition. 
nurses, the nurses today are not the nurses of yesterday. And it's important for us to create our own roles and be able to determine our own destiny. We have to take stock in identifying opportunities that we did not even know were there. There are so many ways that nursing can have value to communities, organizations. We need to be in a C-suite. We need to be on boards. We need to be in every house, and that means the House of Representatives is in every ha the house of the house of all things great and wonderful. But it's important for us to recognize that we have great value at all in all sectors and at all levels of the of, of an organization. And we need to, most importantly, look at how do we create the value proposition for nursing. When someone mentioned this to me the first time, probably as a graduate student, and I said, what is the value proposition for nursing? What does that mean? What is a value proposition? Value is, well, how much does it cost? And how, what, what good is it? The proposition is basically a, a proposal. And nursing is all things great and wonderful. I apologize. I've not been moving around, so my... my um, my motion sensor in my office went out. Okay, let me get back on track. So the value proposition for nursing is created by having an understanding of how important nursing is to health and health care. What do you as a nurse do to add to the value proposition for nursing or the organization and then the profession in general? And creating a story around each individual nurse or each individual nurse practitioner has a huge value for an organization in articulating and also quantifying the return on investment of nursing as a part of the contribution that nursing makes to the organization and to the community and society. And last but not, not least, who's mentoring and coaching you to be the best that you can be? This is one of the things that I often strive to, to do with my junior officers here in, in, in the public health service, and especially here in the Office of the Surgeon General, is to mentor and coach our junior staff to someday become my replacement. It's so easy for us to often forget from whence we came and, um, and to forget that we weren't always at the level that we are now en encumbering. But we need to reach back and pull those individuals along with us because one day we are going to need someone to be the leader of our profession and also to be the leader of, within health and the healthcare environment to take on those more challenging times and more challenging tasks as it relates to building a system that is going to provide service and care for all. And I want to remind everyone about the future of nursing, leading change and advancing health, and this is out of the Institute of Medicine back in 2010. But these values and principles from the future of nursing, and I know that, and I also know that the um, the National Academy of Medicine is about to um, do a, a follow-up to the future of nursing. Uh, publication. So this, this study really does lay the foundation for nursing going forward. And we should be all be able to practice to the full extent of our education and training. Nursing should, nurses should have, um, should achieve higher levels of education and training through an improved education system that promotes seamless and academic progression. And that we should be full partners with physicians and other healthcare professionals in redesigning health and healthcare in the United States. We need an effective workforce planning and policy making um, process so that we can do better data collection and also have an information infrastructure. And these are the areas where I think we all can make a contribution. And I would um, challenge each and every one of you to figure out where do you fit into the future of nursing and make a contribution to be able to build a brighter future for those who are coming behind us, but also build a stronger foundation for the respect and the progression of nursing going forward. Now, last but not least, I want to share my take-home messages. Very important, lead from where you are. You may not be the CEO, you may not be the dean, and you may not be the director, but you are a nurse, and you have something to bring to the table. So lead from where you are and use your strengths to improve the, your, the profession and your practice, to improve the health and health care of the nation. Find your voice. And this is often challenging for nurses um, in general, but I, I know that for many of my colleagues who are practicing in, in some, some of the states and some of the um, organizations across the country that do not allow nurse practitioners to, to really function as they are trained and, and licensed to find their voice, but there is a way in which you can use your advocacy routes and you can also use your education and your policy experience to create a better tomorrow for those who are coming behind you and also to reshape 
and, and retool the nursing profession um, as, as we look to find our voice. Bring someone with you to the party. And I talked about mentoring and coaching, but it's very important as you build your leadership style that as you, be, as you start to um, become more of the professional, as you continue up the, the, um, the, the hierarchy within organizations and expand your, your bandwidth within the nursing profession, that you bring someone with you to the party to be able to train them, mentor them, and coach them to be able to be the executive that you want to be, and they, they will be able to go even further than you've gone in your career. Take care of your team. Take care of yourself. And always remember those who helped you get to where you are. Never forget to be grateful for the opportunity to do what you do. Not everyone can be a nurse, and not everyone can take on the challenges of everyday life as a healthcare professional. But we have a unique uh, position within the community, and we have a unique position within our, in our profession, in that we are the leaders of tomorrow, and we have the responsibility to lead from where we are and to be the example we want others to follow. Now, I want to thank you for your time today, and I look forward to hearing your questions um, at the conclusion of, of this presentation. Thank you. Dr. Trent Adams, this is Lisa Chapel again. Thank you so very much. That was truly inspiring, and you've given us a lot to think about and discuss as we continue to grow at Frontier, and I would encourage anyone to ask questions now. Hello? Hi, my name is Alita, um, and how are you, Dr. Trent Adams? Thank you for, for coming. Um, is is there a way to copy of, of today's um, talk? Like, you cut a lot of important points, and I want to share this with my colleagues. Absolutely. Dr. Chapel, can you make the presentation available to your students? Yes, it will be recorded, and the recording will be posted for people to listen to and um, work through afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I see I have a question posted here on, on in the chat room, and it says, Dr. Trent Adams, what might you tell a brand new are in graduates about leadership. Um, you know, I'm thinking back on what I I was thinking as a, as a new RN graduate, and I'm, it may take me a little bit longer here um, after I've been out a few years. So what I would say is this, a couple of things. For the brand new RN graduate, yes, lead from where you are, but you don't have to do it all in a year. You don't have to take your time to grow and develop in your clinical skills. Always, always have a plan and reassess your goals and objectives on an annual basis. One trick that I use is that um, I, I set two or three, about three goals a year for myself, professionally and, and I three personally. And my birthday is in June, so June and December, I revisit my goals and objectives to see how I'm doing. It's basically my check-in on Am I on track with doing those things I feel are important? And, and I think that does help us to kind of crystallize, and it also helps us to quantify our success or progress towards the big things we want to do in life because every day we're making progress to those goals and objectives that we see for ourselves 10, 20 years down the road. So always have a plan. You don't have to do it all in one, in, at one time. You don't have to finish it all in a year. And most importantly, always, always continue your education, whether it is informally or formally. Uh, and I know I love school, but I would encourage you always to maintain your professional um, education and to continue to grow and learn as, as a nurse, but also as, a, as an individual. Hi, Dr. 
Trent Adams, um, this is Temperance Taylor. I am an FMP student. I'm about to be um, finished with school. And I just wanted to ask you um, your opinion of the role of a mentor in um, kind of raising up nurse practitioners as, as leaders and um, what you would um, what you would encourage um, mentees to ask of their mentors? That's a wonderful question. Um, so first of all, congratulate, congratulations, Temperance, on um, completing your, your studies. And um, I wish you all the best as you move to the next level of your career. Um, so role of a mentor, now that can be very complicated uh, in, some, in some ways, but I, the mentorship is a two-way street. And you need to interview your mentor to make sure it's a good fit. And there are some things you need to make sure you are able to do with this individual. First of all, when you interview, you, you need to find a mentor that is going to be a good fit for you, both from a personality standpoint, um, a style standpoint, and also a commitment. If you are able to get someone to have an agreement with you that you're going to check in, once every quarter, once every three to you know every six months, whatever that may be, that you you mutually agree that that's what you're going to do. So have mutual goals and objectives, and then have a mutual understanding of of respect, because your mentor will have some information to share. But I will tell you, your mentor will also learn from you. So have some ground rules around um, what the expectations are. Get that get that out of the way, and then there are some things that you need to expect of your mentor, and it may not work and don't feel bad about pulling the plug on a mentoring relationship that's not going well. There's nothing wrong with that. People grow and change, and you go in different pathways, and you may reconnect later in life, but make sure you understand that mentorship is a part of development, and you can, pers you can pursue a lot of different aspects of mentorship going throughout your career. And then the last thing is have more than one mentor. I have a mentor who is not, not in healthcare, who is in business and has helped me to understand better the, the economics of, of, of the business model of healthcare, has helped me to understand the, the importance of being present and how to handle certain situations from a professional standpoint and not take things um, always in a healthcare lens. That you have to look at the bottom line every once in a while. And that has truly helped me to develop as a leader and have a business perspective about some of the work that we do here in the department. So I would, I would share that with you. And I have a question here in the chat room. Leadership is a common topic. Often nurses are promoted into leadership positions because they're good nurses. Can you comment on the need for leadership training for nurses? Absolutely, yes. Um, Sometimes good nurses do not make good managers or leaders. And management and leadership are two different things. Managers, and always remember that managers manage tasks and leaders lead people. Um, and in the nursing field, you do need formal training around leadership development and professional development. And there are many courses that you can take. One, one great one is the Harvard Business School on, on management, and there's also a leadership academy at Johnson & Johnson, and there are many other um, programs across the country. And you can read up on them to figure out what works best for you, but the best way to lead is to just start doing it. And that may not be in nursing. It may be leading your home um, homeowners association. It may be being a Girl Scout troop leader. It may be um, being involved in an extracurricular activity such as leading um, a, something related to a hobby. That starts to develop your leadership ability because you're leading people, you're influencing people, you're inspiring people for common, toward, to reach a common goal, and that helps you to understand how to work with people and also helps you to understand how you deal with stress, because there's lots of stress in leadership, how you deal with bad news, and how you deal with having to reprioritize your objectives to best meet the mission's objectives. And that is one of the best things that any nurse or any person in a leadership position can ever have is the opportunity to start to develop your leadership muscles, as I call it, as you grow and learn in your career. Hi, this is Kyra Jefferson. I'm one of the DNP clinical project faculty, and this is great. I really enjoyed this. 
In our DNP clinical projects, we often ask students to develop one major aspect of their project is a team engagement piece. And they always seem to struggle with, well, how do I lead and even motivate the team to make better practice changes or whatever their project topic is? Do you have any words of wisdom that I can share and take back to my students? I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of, of a situation where I've dealt with this, and, and, I, and I'll give you a few anecdotes. First thing is, um, I was asked to lead a team in, in an austere environment um, in 2014, and I hadn't had to do that in quite a while. And I questioned whether or not I was the right person for the job and whether or not I knew what to do to solve the problems that we, we were facing um, in this situation. And I finally just had to say, you know what? Somebody has to be the one to step up, and, I need, and no one's jumping up to take this opportunity, so I'm going to do the best I can to figure out, A, what is the problem here on the ground, what resources do I have to fix it, and then who do I identify the people that can help me to solve the challenges and the problems. And as I started to think through my situation and engage with the people that I was deployed with, we started to come together and solve problems together. Now, what I just described is basically the nursing process, but it can be applied to any leadership situation whereby you're dealing with a team of individuals who may have different backgrounds, different skill sets, and different objectives and being able to different objectives to accomplish in solving the problems. But ultimately, we have the same mission in mind and we're all on the same team. So that being said, what I would share with DNC students is this. Um, when you are faced with a question, a problem, or a challenge, figure out the one common objective that we're all working towards. Second, what is it that you need to be successful? Third, what is the time frame that you're working with? And last but not least, who do you have on your team that you need to plug in to every sector of that situation to be able to intervene, execute, and be successful in solving any problem or overcome the challenge that you're facing. And this is often hard for in the student mode, but it's best to try these things out in the practice environment and in, the, in, in other situations before um, having to be on your own and make these decisions as, as a senior leader. I tell my officers all the time that the mistakes that, they can, that individuals can make as a junior officer are um, not as easy to overcome when they become seniors, senior officers, because there's so much risk and so many other challenges that they will put, um, in, in the, in, put people in harm's way and sometimes even um, cause significant political or financial fallout for the federal government. So, I, I try to tell them, learn as much as you can as you're growing in, in the system. But for um, individuals who are trying to build their team building skills, looking at the problem from a very analytical standpoint and assessing the, the strengths and weaknesses of their, of their team before they make decisions on how to execute. Now, I saw a question um, earlier that was posted about tools for, um, for, for nurses uh, and, and going into the leadership arena, and I wanted to comment on that. Uh, there are many tools, and training is a, is a big part of it, uh, making sure that you're availing yourself to leadership training. And this could be something as simple as an introduction to supervision, introduction, introduction to project management, uh, being able to understand all the policy implications of the work that you do, these are all the skill sets that are needed for nurses and nurse practitioners to be successful at, at the executive level. And I typically break down, um, people ask me all the time, well, what are the three things, what are the things that people need to know to be successful at the executive level? And I said, for, for health, in healthcare, there are three basic components. You need to be clinically excellent. You need to understand the clinical implications of the work that you do. You need to be um, able to administer. Know what it means to be an administrator. Project management, um, oversight, accountability, um, being able to understand your the, the policy ramifications of both regulatory as well as legislative, 
And then last but not least, fiscal. If you do not know how to read the bottom line, you can't survive in the C-suite. You can't be the CEO, you can't be the COO, you can't be the CFO unless you can count across the columns and be able to know what the Excel spreadsheet's bottom line is, what, what it means to interpret losses or gains, uh, return on investment or loss, and that's something that's often challenging for nurses. But if you look at it from this standpoint, we can calculate and take an output. We can do financial spreadsheets. It's that, it's that simple. It just takes a little bit of practice and a different vocabulary. And I think if those of us who have, you know, mastered all of the pharmacology nomenclature and we've learned all the Latin roots for many of the body parts, anatomy and physiology, if you survive through A and P and chemistry and micro, you can master a financial spreadsheet. It just may take a little bit more effort. But those are the three areas I think are important for healthcare leaders is policy, I mean, I'm sorry, clinical excellence, administration, and financial. If you can do those three things, you will be successful. Are there any other questions? Dr. Chapel, did you have any other questions for me? Dr. St. Adam, um, if, if we would like to contact you as a speaker, like, would, would I be able to contact you separately too? Like, if I wanted to invite you to the university, I would just have to do my job. I would have to clear it through the education department, but I think it's written for others. Absolutely. You can so speak on, on leadership. Oh, absolutely. We could, um, you could definitely do that. You could submit a request directly through surgeongeneral.gov on the Surgeon okay. General web page. Um, you can also okay. email directly um, at the email address. Be happy to okay. uh, to work with you on that. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome, ma'am. Someone speaking. Their mic is muted. Thank you. This is Lisa Chapel. I was finally able to get into the BBB. Thank you so very much for your presentation. It was very inspiring to those of us who've been in nursing a long time and to those who are younger in nursing. Well, thank you, Dr. Chapel, for inviting me. And I do appreciate the opportunity to engage with um, nursing students, faculty, whenever I can. It's an honor and a privilege to be a nurse. And I wish you all a very, very happy and productive Nurse Practitioner Week. And I am hoping that I'll get to visit with some of my nurse colleagues who are nurse practitioners and, and, and do the same with them throughout this week. So thank Thanks. you again, and I hope you'll have a wonderful holiday season if I don't speak to you again. Thank you very much. You okay. too. Thank you. You do the same. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.